la decisión de la tarde hay dos intervenciones la primera es de Luis Espinosa, de la Universidad de Autónoma de Barcelona, y que hace un máster sobre tratamiento del lenguaje natural. Y su comunicación es Evil in Terry, Patient of this World, Carpenter Spider, a Burst Figure of a Lord Petinat. But, but, Mr. Lafayette, thank you very much. Um, I wrote everything in English, expecting uh, for uh, in case it was necessary, but yeah, I could have all well speak in Spanish. But yeah, let's, let's move forward. Everything pretty in English, but I'm yeah, pretty sure it's going to go well. So, yeah, um, the, the talk is about evil in a certain type of uh, literary. Yeah, that is the, which is the um, ironic and uh, mocking literature, mocking fantasy literature that the British author Sir Terry Pratchett uh, invented in the early 80s, uh, which is based on the musical. I will explain a bit more what it is in case you're not familiar with it. And specifically, the figure of one of its uh, evil characters uh, called Havelo Petinari, which is one of the, of the bad guys of the of, the, of this uh, book series. We will see the extent to which uh, the language associated with this character uh, represents prototypical evil uh, characters from fantastic literature, or if this language resembles more the language used in higher culture literature, say, say Shakespeare or Newton, etc. So the topic is uh, the talk is divided in five sections: an introduction, a related work section, a couple of details about the character itself. Then I will explain the method I have used to collect the data that has been afterwards processed and analyzed, and a set of conclusions that can be derived from it. Uh, so I don't know the familiarity with the discord my audience, my massive audience has, but. Uh, to put it uh, shortly, the, to put it short and uh, simple, the Discord is a fantasy book series, uh, phenomenally successful, uh, sold millions worldwide, and there have been 39 books written already so far by the British author Secretary Pratchett. So the Discord is a flat world uh, that where many of the stereotypes and cliches from fan classic fantastic literature, Tolkien, Lovecraft, C.S. Lewis, or classics like Shakespeare, or mythology, folklore, or fairy tales uh, are present. Uh, the, what the author does is he takes these stereotypes and twists them in a way uh, so that we can see a kind of allegor an allegory or a metaphor uh, from our own world represented in this uh, in this fictional uh, flat world. In fact, the author describes the Discord as a world and a mirror of worlds. Uh, within this uh, fictional world, we've got a very big city, city-state called Ant Morbor, which is the capital of uh, the busiest city in this uh, Discord, and it's ruled by Havel of Petinari, also known as the Patrician. Uh, this is the character I am going to be speaking about and looking to, at the extent to which uh, he is uh, associated with a kind of language that is usually associated with uh, evil characters in fantastic literature. And just to give a gist of the kind of language that these books, uh, these kind of books use and the, the author is, is known for, uh, let me quote Mort, the fourth uh, book of the, of the series, and the quote goes like this. And Morbord had dallied with many forms of government and had ended up with that form of democracy known as one man, one vote. The patrician was the man and he had the vote. Uh, so as you can see, there's uh, the, this tendency of taking um, um, status quo uh, idea or establishment and then make a twist in order to, well, first to get the gap and it's all for the fun, but then we will realize that it's not only about that. Uh, now, now that we have speaking, uh, spoken a little bit about the discord, it's important to know the context of fantastic literature because it really gives a point of uh, it, 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 it's, it gives us the the ground 
for making the, the point they claim of this, of this presentation. The literature of fantasy, as it has come to be known, is the most obvious side in which a struggle of good and evil is seen to be taking place. Uh, and if we move forward to the second um, statement, it goes like this. The general assumption is that fantasy literature portrays the fight between good and evil in absolute terms. So, in general, whenever uh, fantastic literature was written, it was targeted towards a certain kind of audience. Children, young adult readers, young readers, and the idea was to make fantastic literature a way to educate the kids, and for this reason, uh, the struggle between the good and the evil is clear-cut and complicated, and there is no room for ambivalence or for ambiguity. Uh, my claim is that this character, the Dinari, despite being an evil character and despite being included in a fantastic setting, is by no means treated as a prototypical evil character in fantastic literature, such as Voldemort would be done, he would be treated as in Harry Potter or Sauron in the Lord of the Rings. Elaborating on this argument, uh, let's make this quote of Sullivan, 2005, who mentioned that evil is not a sudden or an ambiguous force in our world today, yet children's and young adult fantasy literature how often portray evil in dichotomous or uncomplicated ways. And yeah, specifically, speaking about the Lord of the Rings, uh, the moral regulations are very clear cut, so there is no possibility of ambiguity. One more point that describes evil in fantastic literature is the following. Uh, there has been a kind of evolution of how uh, evil has been depicted in, in literature and literary criticism. Uh, we've got a review of the, the, many, the Many Faces of Evil, uh, which was reviewed in Somoza in 2002. And, well, well there's, the, the point of this talk is not uh, the, the evolution of evil, but it's, I think it's very interesting to see that in the 20th century, the last stage of this evolution, evil was associated with being a criminal, troubled, or sick. So there, were, there was this idea of starting to understand or starting to try to, uh, to try to understand the reasons and the context that was involved in uh, cunning characters, in people making evil. And this Actually, this matches very well uh, another uh, couple of, of works by Somoza and Konigin and Horn, uh, who mentioned the following, that uh, most truly evil characters speak little or hardly anything, uh, so it's very difficult to trace a polarity uh, of what they say, but we can know, uh, we, we, we can see how the guys are behaving when they act not when they speak. And in fact, when they do speak, because they start to get complicated, we start to perceive the justification, the motives and reasons for doing evil. So in some, we start to understand. Um, so there's this uh, uh, discrepancy between how evil is treated in fantastic literature and how evil is treated in higher culture literature. So, yeah, to sum up, we have that evil characters in fantastic literature are just bad, period. Mm -hmm. They usually have poor eye or childish motivations, such as world domination or vengeance. Uh, they generate little or no empathy from the readers, and the reason for this is that they don't convey this kind of complexity. Uh, the Rehazon death seems to have more to do with their nemesis, in most cases the hero, than with themselves. And in general, they don't comply with the generalized portrayal of evil that is used in high culture works. Um, this quote is, meant, is the first one where the patrician is described in the discourse books. It's from the seventh one, and despite being a bit long, I think it's very, very good to, to, to point a couple of, of ideas here. So if you don't mind, I need to read it. Uh, the current patrician, head of the extremely rich and powerful the Dinari family, was thin, tall, and apparently as cold-blooded as a dead penguin. Just by looking at him, you could tell he was the sort of man you'd expect to keep a white hat and carry it idly while sentencing people to death in a piranha And you'd hazard for good measure that he probably collected rare thin porcelain, 
turning it over and over in his blue white fingers while distant screams echoed from the depths of the dungeons. You wouldn't put it past him to use the word exquisite and half fingers. He looked the kind of person who, when they blink, you mark it off the calendar. And you know, the next paragraph starts by saying, actually, none of this was true. And the point that the author is making is that he is using the stereotype of a prototypical evil character to build a much more complicated personality. This complicated personality is reflected in uh, passages like, no one can be as sane as he is without being mad, or the denying was clever. You need a state ruler of a fermenting mess of a city like this, like this one, by being silly. If you saw his spy, it was a spy he wanted you to see. The way you'd know that Bettinari was keeping an eye on you would be by turning around very quickly and seeing no one at all. And finally, an elaboration of the previous argument. Technically, the city of Frank Morburg is a tyrant, which is not always the same thing as a monarchy. And in fact, even the post of tyrant has been somewhat redefined by the incumbent Lord Bettinari as the only form of democracy that works. Everyone is entitled to vote, unless disqualified by reason of age or not being Lord Bettinari. This is an officialist illustration, so as you can see, there are many prototypical traces, physical traces, that would describe this guy as a typical stereotype evil character from any fantastic, any young adult uh, uh, complex. Now, the claim that he is not dealt with in the same way prototypical uh, evil characters would be uh, is supported by two uh, text processing methods that I will be presenting very shortly now. First one is uh, following the classic you should know a word by the company of kids. We look at the polarity of sentiment heavy phrases appearing in the vicinity of a dinari or patricia. By vicinity we mean a window of 10 words to the left or 10 words to the right. And then we look at the sentiment associated with the binary with this naive approach. As you may, we make very strong assumptions, uh, but in NLP, in most cases, strong assumptions work. And number two, look at the located trigrams of the form the binary was plus word or patrician was plus word in order to uncover recurrent patterns. So for the first method, method we follow a classic in opinion mining, and the method consists in the following. You take the text and you extract chunks where Petinari or Patrician appear. And then within this restricted window, you look for phrases that can potentially convey sentiment. These phrases, I didn't come up with them. They have been, uh, it's, it's been assumed that there are certain phrases that are more likely to convey a kind of polarity than others. Uh, for example, an adverb followed by an adjective, followed by anything but a noun, etc. So it, and you've got a whole uh, detailed list in the paper by the and then each of these phrases is scored using a sentiment lexicon, uh, which was released by Huan Yu in 2004. The negation is handled by reverting the score of phrases uh, with not of the contraction NT. So if you go not good, that would be uh, one point for the negative one. So this is the way the negation is handled. As so you can see, very naive approach, uh, quantitative method. Second, a uh, method it consists in co computing pointwise mutual information for trials of the form that it was and attrition was plus a word, and to see to what extent these collocated patterns reflect Pratchett's writing style and the profile of the patrician. And the results are the following. So we've got uh, one of the points I want to make is that associated to a prototypical evil character, you have almost twice as many positive phrases than negative phrases. Uh, the, this is an informative sample the, because language is so sparse, we, it, it is very difficult to have high frequencies in, this, in these terms. So most of the phrases occurred only once. Um, so these are only, as, as I say, this is a very small sample. I think the interesting uh, piece of information here is the big discrepancy between positive language and negative language uh, when associated to what is supposed to be a very iconic and evil character. And if we look at the results from the collocated trigrams, uh, we see the following. We see, first of all, that he's actually behaving like a politician with, the, with all the complexity that that uh, entails. Many passive verbs like wait, stand, sit, or think are highly associated with him. Uh, there is a general positive tone. Uh, there are high scores for clever and good. And finally, 
something that I was very, very, very surprised to see, and I think it's a very nice thing to see, is that the highest score goes to the world behind. So the binary of the position was behind, behind the person, behind the situation, behind the problem, and usually behind the solution as well. So it is saying a lot, it is revealing a lot of the personality of this person. Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, just to conclude, to say that it is after going through uh, the corpus of Tory Pratchett's school and looking at the occurrences of the patrician, again, from a very naive point of way, we can uh, conclude that the patrician resembles less fantasy evil characters as such than adult evil characters, than high culture evil, evil characters. He conveys an unquestionable complexity, an ambivalence, and ambiguity of language. We, as readers, uh, become attracted to his figure, his motivations and expectations, and we also become attracted to his fascinating needs. Going one step further, we could even uh, extend the discussion to the question, is actually Medinari an evil character? So is, is he really an, an evil character? Because as Somoza says, uh, almost no truly important uh, character in literature is truly evil. There is always this ambivalence, ambivalence that uh, is not present in classic uh, fantastic literature. Uh, this is these are the references I use, and I'm done.